we welcome you to the Priscilla R. Tyson Cultural Arts Center for our conversations and coffee for August 3rd, 2023. I'm Ellen O'Shaughnessy, coordinator of the program. We're honored to have with us today our artists who are among us here. Let's start here with Brooke Slobodian. Right. And your mother. Hi. Hi, Amy. And Sarah Hahn, who's our instructor here. And Sophie Nee. So happy to have you with us. What a great community. What a great way of contributing to our city, to our own lives, huh? Do you love art? Ah, yes. So, as we learn more about our artists today, uh, we'll appreciate all the more their presence among us. Sarah Hahn graduated from Ohio Wesleyan University with a Bachelor of Fine Arts in Ceramics, Figure Drawing and Sculpture, and Master of Fine and Studio Arts from University of Kentucky, the College of Fine Arts. She has instructed us in ceramics, drawing, sculpting courses at a number of colleges with workshops as well. Sarah creates vibrant sculptures of some of today's most known figures in the classical style. She was commissioned by the Veterans Memorial 196th Infantry Brigade to create a public sculpture. Wow. And last night, I was at the fair in the art gallery provided by the fair, the Cox Gallery, and I was rejoicing in how many people have been part of, artists have been part of Conversations and Coffee, and I was presented by Sarah Hahn's amazing 21st century sculpture entitled, one entitled Joy and the Other Anguish. It's exquisite. Be sure to look for Sarah Hahn's work. Sophie Nee, you're born in England, huh? South of London, and you emigrated to the United States in 1988. You graduated from Ohio State University summa cum laude with distinction in printmaking and from Texas Tech University with a Master of Fine Arts in printmaking and drawing. Sophie's represented by the Sharon Weiss Gallery in the Short North Arts District. Wonderful. And Amy Slobodian, she works with clay, and it started out with mud when she began her life as an artist, as a child. She fashioned pinch pots out of mud that she mixed in the backyard. Aside from the third grade clay art project, her formal training began in the late 1970s at our beloved Cultural Arts Center. And here she studied hand building under the watchful eye of the famous instructor, Helene, whom we all remember so well. 20 years later, she returned to study sculpture and found her way to the pottery studio, where she focused on hand building functional and decorative pieces. Ah, we will see them as time goes on, huh? Yes. <laughs> hand building. <laughs> she works in midrash clays and porcelain using her pieces as a canvas for decorative techniques such as carving, scraffito, scarato, uh -huh, underglaze painting, wax recessed, and slip application. You have to tell us about this. Her famous fish bowls were inspired by the beauty of objects found in water. Stones along the shores of Lake Michigan and Lake Superior, and flora and fauna found in streams and other bodies of water. You'll tell us more and about how people will put their fingers into the water 
<laughs> I have one at our home. And many people do that and go, huh? <laughs> Amy's received the Mako Colors Award at the 2016 Fine Arts Exhibition at the Ohio State Fair, and an honorable mention at the 2022 Cultural Arts Center Student Instructor Art Exhibit. Brooks Slobodian, Amy's son, is it any surprise that you've been inspired as an artist? <laughs> Brooke is a multimedia artist living and working in Columbus. He focuses his work in the disciplines of ceramics, metalwork, and to a lesser degree, woodworking. Hmm? And glasswork as well as Japanese crafts, such as bonsai and suseki. Brooke's works include functional porcelain and sculptural, scriptural, uh, sculptural <laughs> naked raku fired vessels that incorporate metallic ornamentation and occasionally glass or wood elements. He's been working in these mediums since his teen years and strive to further his craft through both taking classes and teaching. Your students are gifted. Hmm? Do you ever, they ever tell you so? Uh, <laughs> the awards is, uh, in his work in ceramic have been granted by the Ohio State Fair Fine Arts Exhibition and the Ohio Craft Musician and the Cultural Arts Center. Hmm? Sophie, Sarah, Amy, Brooke, thank you for being with us. Sarah, let's begin with you. The instructor, huh? Yeah. yeah. Hmm? yeah I, I uh, you can start the library. Here we go. Wonderful. Oh, this is fun. And just keep yeah. it right up. To OK. Side. Perfect. OK. Yeah, so all of these students, um, in air quotes, are wonderful artists I get to work with uh, once a week. So I'm glad that you're up here with me. So I guess we'll get started. Um, so I'm going to go through some of my work, starting with what I started, a few pieces from undergrad, working up to what I'm doing currently. So uh, when I was in undergraduate school or in my undergraduate program, I was working more installation-based, really taking over that gallery space and filling it up. So these are different children's blocks that have different figures inside. And then on the back wall, you can see there are kind of mimicking the Barbie doll kind of accessory packs. Um, and then there's like different jacks laying on the floor and a bouncy ball hanging from the ceiling. So I think this piece was more addressing some of my fears of graduating from school and having to start the, the real world and trying to figure everything out. So I tried to approach that in a really playful manner here. Um, this next piece, uh, again, another installation piece. Um, this one had, we, this was more in prompt from an assignment. So it was, um, we had to create a shrine. So this was the centerpiece of the shrine. So the, the trunk in the middle here is clay. And then I brought, oh, that's the only picture we got. Um, <laughs> I made three ceramic trees and then filled the gallery with leaves and dirt. And throughout the exhibition, the ceramic trees kind of blossomed. So they started with the little buds and then bloomed into um, trees that had flowers and apples growing from them. So that was kind of part of my scriptural or my um, sculptural interpretation of an altar. And the tree growing out of the middle of the tree trunk here was just to symbolize regrowth and rebirth. So then moving on to uh, my work from graduate school. So this series was called Of Gods and Demigods. So in that series, um, you know, going to the grocery store for the first time really by myself as an adult, I was just bombarded with all these magazines with like the Kardashians and Justin Bieber. And I had locked myself in the studio when I was in uh, undergrad, so I didn't know who these people were. So I was really kind of fascinated <laughs> by our obsession with them. So um, I thought, you know, it w having this classical background, having learned um, of these classical sculptures, and how they used to worship their ancient gods, um, thinking of how we kind of have a celebrity worship in our culture. So I was taking the classical sculptures and then putting the contemporary figures into those poses. So this piece is um, Pluto and Persephone. It's a classical sculpture that you can see here at the bottom right. And then I put in Chris Brown and Rihanna. Um, 
So that kind of dates this piece a little bit, kind of that's what was going on um, in the celebrity world at the time. This piece is probably around four and a half to five feet tall, so it is quite large, um, not as large as the original classical sculpture. But also with this work, I try to um, interject both the classical elements, so the three-headed dog, with the contemporary. So underneath the dog's paw, there is a cell phone, which kind of, like, caused this whole event to start in the first place between Rihanna and Chris Brown. Um, so this is another piece in that series, The Rape of the Sabian Women with the Twilight characters. This one's a lot smaller. This one's probably around 18 inches tall. I was playing around with some different underglazes and color with these pieces. And then this one's another larger one. This one's probably about four feet tall. Um, this is Bacchus as Little Wayne. So some close-ups of the details there. Uh, this was an ice sculpture that we had at a bar in the um, one of the local campus locations. I didn't create the. I did have someone create the ice sculpture for me, um, but it was part of trying to invoke the rites of Bacchus. So he would have had different ceremonies about frivolity and drinking. So this was kind of to tie that in with what goes on at a college campus. Um, this is Daniel in the lion's den with Tim Tebow. This one is about three feet tall, including the back um, column pieces. And if you can see in the picture, he's kind of hiding, but there is a lion kind of back licking the back of his foot that's out to the side there. This is Apollo and Daphne with Knight and Nelson. Um, this one is a lot smaller. It's about 18 inches. Um, this one, the celebrities that I chose were more internet, so that's where this one breaks apart from the more, the bigger celebrities that are well known. This was a court case, I believe in Iowa, where a dentist had fired his dental assistant for being too attractive. So it's kind of pulling more from a popular internet story rather than a more uh, popular uh, celebrity story. This is Lao Kuhn with Joe Paterno. This one, again, is fairly small. It's about 12 inches in height. And then the Dying Gall with Lance Armstrong. This one's about 24 inches wide. Again, playing with color, leaving the, kind of the red base is the terracotta clay, so leaving the raw clay body, and then adding in a little pop of color, really to make those metals and the Nike symbols really pop for this piece. This is Cupid Awakening the Psyche with Justin Bieber and Miley Cyrus. Um, this one's fairly large. It's about 36 inches wide. The wings on this one remove just to help with transportation, so they kind of key in in the back. Yeah. Another view of that one. This is Nessus as Charlie Sheen. Um, so uh, about 24 inches tall for this piece, so a little bit smaller. Um, playing around with um, a different building method for this one, building solid and then hollowing it out. Uh, Diana with Sarah Palin. So this is another larger one that's about four feet tall. And then the Three Graces with the Kardashians. I always have to show the backside because I spend so much time on the flowers. So you always have to see the back to see the floral crowns. And then this is Heracles and Telephos with Arnold Schwarzenegger. Um, just kind of, this is my husband's favorite piece, so I always have to include it in the presentation. So that concludes kind of that, that work, which I really enjoyed doing. Um, it gets a good chuckle for the people that know what's going on. But I did want to move on to some pieces that maybe had a little bit more meaning or a little bit more soul to them. So my more current series is titled Ripples into the Universe. So I started working a little bit more abstractly, um, thinking of these ripples that kind of break apart and then come back together, um, really looking at the ideas behind the butterfly effect, how all these little chain reactions can lead to much bigger um, reactions. So this one was actually cast in bronze. Um, so that's why you're seeing more of that vertical, like that would be challenging to do with clay just because of the verticality in the open space. Another bronze piece is infinite, kind of along that same idea. 
some other um, abstract pieces in that series that are ceramic. So you're seeing more of the color um, coming through and just a little bit more elaborate because um, I didn't have to deal with some of the technical aspects of the casting process. Um, these ones are probably the, the one on the right titled, title is um, about 20 inches wide and then the nebula would be about 22, so it's a little bit wider. So I'd spent all this time developing my skills with figurative work, so I didn't want to completely throw that out the window. Um, so then I started to think, how can I combine these abstract forms with figurative components to maybe tell more of a story of what I'm trying to portray with this series? So here I have some of those abstract forms kind of surrounding this figure that's kind of taking a reflective moment, like a, a deep breath. So for me, this is um, finding calm and chaos. This was a I forget what year this was exactly, but it was around one of the big elections. So you just can imagine all the thoughts and um, emotions that were surrounding um, that time frame. So that's kind of what this piece is in reference to. Yeah, yeah. that's loosely based on me. So I, at this time also, so obviously with the celebrity portraits, I couldn't be like, hey, little Wayne, can you come pose for me? So I was using all online images, what I could find there. So at this point in my pursuits, I was trying to get back to using live models more. Yeah. So good eye. <laughs> yeah. Perfect image. Oh, thank you. Um, so this is Anguish. So this is one of the pieces that is in the Ohio State Fair exhibit currently. Um, so this one was just dealing with the emotions that come with anguish. So all of these events in our life that can cause these feelings of pain and anguish that even though they hurt can actually build us into who we are. And then here is the piece Joy that is also at the same exhibit at the Ohio State Fair. So along the same ideas, just portraying a different emotion with joy, um, just all of these feelings, all of these events in our life that have come together to create joy and create who we are as a person. This one is Peace. So with this one, it might be hard to see, but um, there are kind of raised scriptures from different religious texts from um, a broad range of um, scriptures. So not just Christian, but uh, Muslim scriptures and Buddhist scriptures, just kind of showing for all of our differences at the end of the day, the end goal is peace. So um, hopefully we can find a way to weave that together to get to that goal. And that piece is currently at the Zanesville Museum of Art. Um, this piece is titled One, so I just currently, right after finishing, or before I finish this piece, I just had my daughter and feeling very overwhelmed with everything that's going on with life and uh, worried about how we're going to raise her and what the future is going to be. Um, so this was kind of me coming to terms with that, that I have to come to peace with this is the world that we're in and you know, if I'm afraid of missiles or bullets or how the planet's going to turn out, um, you know, so I've got different symbolism in here. So in the roots here, there's a bullet um, just to kind of show that sense of danger. There's an airplane here just to show technology and that movement forward. There is a whale, which for me personally represents um, the connection to nature and kind of what we're doing with the planet. And then there's a cupcake, it's hard to see, but it's hidden in the treetops, and that's just the relationship to food. Um, and then the kite, just that idea of um, youthful exploration and just all the events in your life from when you were a child that make you who you are. So that's kind of what this piece is representing for me. And then this piece is together. So the hands for this piece are about life size. Um, starting to incorporate the dandelion and the actual butterfly to convey that butterfly effect. So for me, the dandelion is kind of this flower that represents things that we don't want in our yard, but they actually have great benefits. So we perceive them as a weed, even though they help our soil. They can be eaten. The, the flower can use, be used for dye. So it's kind of my reinterpretation of what that dandelion means and kind of that movement forward um, to come together. This is a larger version, so this one's probably between three and four feet tall, so a larger dandelion with a small child um, kind of piling 
pollen on top of this bee in the background. So this one's my most recent piece that I just finished. Um, this was a group project with um, cast hands. So it's called Brace Embracing Love. So I wanted all of the hands to be indistinguishable, whether they're male, female, what skin color, um, just really to show at the end of the day we're trying to embrace love. So again, along those same li lines as peace. I'm going to scroll through the monuments really quick. So I also do some monument work. I've worked with an artist, Alan Cottrell. So um, these are bronze monuments that are throughout. Uh, this one's in Cleveland, football player. This one's at Fort Benning in Columbus, Georgia. This one is outside of Alan's studio. Um, it might also be in another location, I'm not sure. So with bronze, you can get multiple casts. That's why it might be in two locations. And then these are some commissions that I've done throughout the years. Um, some wedding gifts, some small little pieces. And then this is the bigger project that I've worked on with the 196 Light Infantry Brigade. And this is also at Fort Benning in Columbus, Georgia. So this is a Vietnam memorial that they commissioned. Sorry. This one's seven feet. Yeah, yeah. They were standing next to it getting pictures when we dedicate it. And they're like, you know, we weren't that big. I was like, yeah, I'm trying to like highlight. Make it this more is, grandiose. This is extraordinary. Yeah, well, A thank round you. of applause yeah. for our instructor. <laughs> and I'm going to pass it off to Sophie. Yes. And Sophie, next to you. Yes. When you were doing those sculptures, the first ones you showed, some of them were so small and some were big. Is it easier Here, or harder? Harder. Wait. harder. To do big or small. Um, they both present different challenges. So the bigger ones, a lot of them had to be done in parts and get metal um, supports on the inside just to, to fit in the kilns and then to be able to transport. Whereas the smaller ones, just refining and getting detail, like really sharp detail, that's something that I've had to like progress from. So if you look at that twilight piece versus what I do now, it's just night and day. So like I'd say the refining to get those small pieces is much more challenging. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. The slide, the kind of story that I want to tell today is a story about connections. And I'm thinking about connections in terms of how they work within works of art and how they work between people and then connections between different ideas in art. So I think as artists, we all make work about whatever is going on in our worlds and in our lives, but we make that work in the context of the people that are around. and. Um, so one of the things that I love about shared studio spaces is that you get all these artists in one space. Um, and no matter whether they're teachers or students or who they are, there's this, when it's working well, there's this great energy that you get from just being a part of a group like that. And like any class you take, you meet um, amazing people and that then kind of feeds into your art and it, it just like creates a monster. So um, I'll, I'll try and go quick through this. Um, some of the connections in this are visual. I may, may not verbalize all of them, but maybe you will catch them visually as I go. Um, oh, so connections. Um, so as an illustration of that, here's a collage um, where what you think about an image changes depending on what you put it next to or kind of whether it's upside down or right side up, or you know, the context that you see things in, it matters. Um, so yeah, I was born in England, and there are some things about that that I just have to quickly go over. Um, so England's part of the United Kingdom. It's an island. It's not even a very big island. So wherever you are, you're near the edge. It's also the kind of place that, um, if you go to the beach, you might wear a coat and wellies because the climate is like that. <laughs> um, so here, here I am again on that beach might actually be in France. So that's another thing about England is that you are very close to the neighbors. So you can go to France um, in the part of England where I grew up. You could be in France with not that much more effort than it takes to get to like Cleveland. Um, so I think that's on the beach in either Calais or Boulogne. 
Um, and it's sculpture. So, you know, early beginnings of sculpture and the beach is a place that you can make something as big as you want to make it. There we go. Another thing about England is China. I had a lovely English grandmother who was a China collector and her house was full of China. Um, this is a print um, of a spode pestle and mortar that is in my house. Um, so it's English China, um, something that gives me a feeling of connection to my roots, I guess. Oh, that's the second version of this because this was actually a collaborative project, the spode um, pestle and mortar. Um, I got involved with a woman who was a chemist and she was experimenting with pigment chemistry. So in version one, that's made with commercially available pigment and version two, that is made with kind of this chemist woman's homemade pigments, which by the way, some of them were quite toxic things. The blue, <laughs> I think she did make that blue with cobalt. <laughs> Um, here is another object that is kind of China related from another, it, it was a project that I got sucked into. It was called um, Art360. And the prompt was you get an ostrich egg um, and you need to make art on the ostrich egg. Um, and next to the ostrich egg is a chicken egg, which was proof of concept egg because I was determined because I was a printmaker at the time. Um, I'm, gonna, um, I'm gonna print on an egg somehow. So you don't learn about printing on eggs in school. They don't teach that. Um, so everything that I did to the big egg, I first did to the tiny egg to make sure that it was going to work. Oh, did I just do something wrong? I fixed it. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so leave England to go get educated, and everything changes. Um, so I started college. When I went to college, I had background in drawing and painting and not really very much else. And I got to Ohio State and one of the first things that I discovered was printmaking. Um, and the print lab, it's a shared studio. So because printing presses are heavy and expensive, we have X number of them. They're in one space and all the students have to share. So the print lab was really my first experience of that kind of shared studio magic. And there are some pictures to prove it. It's very old now. Um, so that's me printing a litho <laughs> in 93, I think. It's long ago. Oh, and that is a shot. Um, this is my studio when I was a graduate student at Texas Tech. Um, it's not a great photo, but um, so as a graduate student, I was making printed things, but then my prints turned into kind of big impractical constructed environments. And I could do that because I had a lot of space and time. Um, and this shot and this other one, it's kind of like a view inside my brain at the time, which is a little bit scary. It was crowded. Um, and there's just all this stuff going on in there. Um, and that's an object from around that time. This is a quilt that is made of prints. It's, I think it was um, kind of about the size of a twin bed because when you start sewing your prints together, it's amazing how quickly you get to be on six feet. Um, and yeah, so it has a lot of connections in it as well. I was thinking a lot about images of women in art. So that's kind of the background. And then the overlay is the fool from the tarot pack, um, who is a figure representing like adventure. Um, so after school, you graduate, you go work, and everything changes. Um, so this is kind of getting into the story of how I ended up here at Cultural Arts. Um, so once I was a working stiff, I had a lot less time and space to make art. And basically, Ohio State had a program at the time um, where they would do a printmaking workshop maybe like three or four times a year. So I would work all the time and I'd be thinking in my head about like what I was gonna make at the next printmaking workshop and then I'd show up on like a Saturday and I'd be there for 12 hours straight and I made, these are monotypes, um, so this is a monotype of a, a pug. Um, and this was the body of work that I was making when I first started really exhibiting regularly. Um, and then 
maybe 10 years later, I'm working as adjunct faculty. Um, so there's work associated with that. Um, that's in there because you're going to see that pattern come back. Um, so there I am during that time. Um, I have Helen Hoffelt to thank for that photograph. Um, I was trying to record myself, and at some point she walked in and just cleaned my clock and took photos that like, are way nicer than mine. <laughs> um, that's the thing that I was making. That is a, um, it's a single layer viscosity monotype in case anybody is like into printmaking. Um, so inside every good teacher is a student waiting to get out. Um, I found out about the C Cultural Arts Center. Um, when I first learned about it, I wanted to take the weaving class, but it's like impossible to get in. And at some point I was just like, I'm signing up for a class no matter what. And where there was space was copper enameling. So this was like the first things that I made in copper enameling, and they're bad. Um, <laughs> And what I learned in copper enameling was that I needed to learn to shape metal so I could make something that wasn't just square. Um, so then I took metals. In metals, I learned that um, I'm a bit of a caveman with metal. I like fire. I like hammers and hitting things. I'm not so great with like the fine stuff, but I learned to raise bowls. So those are a couple of those things. Um, oh, and then that kind of fed back into copper enameling. So this is a little enameled fish that is maybe like two inches long. And I etched it. So there's the connection back to printmaking and etching. Um, and then, you know, I'd learned to saw a piece of metal with a saw at that point. So, um, yeah, so a little tiny multicolored fish. And then that fed back into my printmaking work too. So this is a, um, it's an etching plate that I made around the same time, and it prints like that. So English China again, there it is. <laughs> Global pandemic changes everything. <laughs> again, okay, I'll speed up. Um, shut in my house, I made strange stuff. One of my raised bowls I etched. I'd been reading about medieval medicine. So it's a medicine bowl. This is another thing from that time, which is like, what was she thinking? It's actually a king-size bedsheet, and it is indigo dyed, and the resist was made by sewing. Um, also, during that time, I made this kit as a way to get better at using Photoshop. You can sew it, and it turns into this. And oh, it's three-dimensional. So this is all during lockdown. Lockdown was over. Um, I thought, I need to take a 3D class, which is how I met Sarah Hahn. <laughs> Oops. Um, and I think, I'm afraid in the first class I ever took, I was like, I'm just making a flying pig. Don't talk to me. <laughs> so I made this flying pig. It's not the greatest flying pig in the world. It has structural issues. But Sarah helped me a bunch. And then, Oh, there's another flying pig. That's from my teaching days. Flying pigs were like a default demo thing for me. So don't know what to make, make a flying pig. <laughs> Students love them. So Sarah knew a bunch of stuff that I wanted to know. Part of that was use of glazes and slips. Um, this is a glaze and slip piece made in Sarah's class. Um, I made this because I know Carolyn Klinkenboomer, and that's maybe all I need to say about that. It's an outdoor incense burner. Eventually, I made a better flying pig. Um, and then this is kind of the current work. I make work about whatever's happening in my life. I have a lot of things about food. Um, that piece, is, it's the size of like a lunch plate. It's called I Can't Swallow. Um, this is another thing. Um, I wouldn't have made this if I didn't know Sarah Hahn. <laughs> so, so Sarah said we should make heads. I thought, well, if you're going to make a head, you might as well make a pedestal and give it horns. <laughs> I keep doing that. After that came um, Medusex, which is a life-sized head. Um, more food more food. And then these last pieces, I swear I'm finishing, these are in, <laughs> in the Ohio State Fair this year. Um, 
they're themed around justice, accusation, forgiveness. The prayer around the edge is, um, it's a prayer in Latin that is a prayer for justice, but it's also a prayer for mercy. And each head has an accusation in spaghetti, and then they're drowning in spaghetti. So there's three of them. And that is the end of my slides. Oh, magnificent. I swear. Thank you, Sophie. Thank you. Good afternoon, and thank you for coming to this wonderful facility. It's a gem in Columbus, Ohio, and it's a wonderful place to work and to, to visit. So I hope you'll all come back. Okay, this is just one of, I'm gonna talk about these fish bowls that I've been making. Um, I'm just gonna take you through the process. This is the first one, I hate to show this because it's so awful, but there it is. And so I start out with a bowl and I make clay, pebbles, rocks, and I'm just starting to paint this. This is just another image of that. So these rocks I, I see at Lake Michigan and I see them in creek beds and that's how I came upon this, standing in a creek bed and looking down and everything looks so beautiful in the water. So I wanted to bring that home with me. So this is just um, the raw clay and this is before it gets fired the first time and those fish are just um, underglazed. And that's fired. This will be quick. And now this has a glaze, and the fish have been fired. And I'm going to get ready to pour resin. Did you make the bowls? Yes, I, and I hand build the bowls. I'm not a great thrower, so <laughs> this works better for me. <laughs> Maybe someday. And here I have a group of bowls that some are poured, some are midway through, and some of the things that are going in the bowls are sitting on the side there. So when you pour resin, you need to take precautions. You need to wear a mask. You need to, I would wear glasses or goggles and gloves. And then I use um, this little torch here, which is very handy for getting rid of bubbles that you don't want. So when I'm setting in these copper pieces, I just um, have to secure them so when I pour the resin, they stay where they're supposed to be. And uh, sometimes I have to position them a little bit, use different things to put them where I want them to stay. And this is just mid-pour, so I've got one layer of resin down, and then I'm setting these fish in so they're not sitting on the bottom. And I had a line up here. So alive looking. <laughs> Amazing. So I've got a whole line of them here one day and kept busy with that and my torch. That's your yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's covered. And you can get that resin off if you use alcohol. <laughs> and we've got some current ones right here. So um, this is a process. I'm just taking you through one bowl from the beginning to the end. So the clay, this one was a, a commission. And then we get the fish in. This one was done for East Coast ocean, um, things that you're going to find on the East Coast, turtles, uh, crabs, starfish. This is the beginning of another bowl. This is more woodland. The underglaze is there. Underglazes are wonderful because you can paint them on before you fire, and then after it's fired, you can go back and touch it up again before you do a glaze firing, so that's really nice. And we do have a lot of underglazes, which is really lovely. <laughs> and that's poured. And this one was West Coast Tide Pool. And these are just finished bowls that I'm going to go through. So everything's made of clay except for the copper pieces.
And that is my process. Thank you for coming. So it's interesting to be here in, in the midst of such fabulous sculptors when I am not a sculptor at all. <laughs> I am uh, fairly limited to making things on the potter's wheel. So everything I make is round and uh, non-figurative. Um, I'm in awe of people who can sculpt. Over here on the table. Yeah, we all have some uh, examples of our work over here on this table. And anyone's free to pick up my work. I, I just don't drop it. That's all I really ask. Um, so I work, uh, at, and at the Cultural Arts Center specifically, I work in porcelain. And this is actually what is known as high fire porcelain. So there are certain ranges that clay is fired to. Um, low fire would be like your terracotta, what you would see, plant pots and stuff like that made out of. Mid fire is what you might see, a lot of mugs and bowls uh, that are used in the house. Um, and then there is high fire, and this is what I do, is, is high fire porcelain. And the beautiful part about high fire porcelain is that you can get this wonderful translucent quality to porcelain. It almost turns, essentially it is, glass at that point. Um, and I've always fantasized about being able to make things with pliable glass and firing them and have them be clear. But until that technology is developed, I'm, I'm happy with this. So this is a technique um, which I've been doing for quite a few years now called rice grain porcelain. And this originates um, in China and there's examples of it in Korea and Japan as well um, as long ago as about 800 years ago where holes are actually pierced through the porcelain uh, before it's fired and when a glaze is applied, a translucent glaze is applied, it fills in those holes and creates essentially little windows. So this piece is over on the table and again you can feel free to go pick it up. This consists of several hundred individually drilled tiny little holes to form this kind of, um, what would we call it, like a, 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 not a bunting, but a, maybe a, a, a necklace or, or negligee kind of look. Uh, to it, but you can actually see the light come through the holes here, but it is still functional You can still eat or drink out of it. So I'm just gonna run through a few of these porcelain pieces But just know that wherever you're seeing these this light coming through these lighter portions has been pierced all the way through the piece So they start off as holes. You wouldn't be able to use it, but then uh, translucent, translucent glaze is inlaid into those holes and then when it's fired it creates these windows I absolutely just love playing with light. Uh, it is one of my favorite things um, to be able to hold a piece up to the light and see through it. it it's it's magical in a way, um, and it's the first thing I do. Table, huh? Yes, wow. yes, that piece is over there as well. Yeah. Um, and uh, in fact, if you'd want to pick up that piece and, and pass it around, that is absolutely fine. And recommend holding it up to the light. Just it it. That's the one, yep. It does belong to my partner, so she'd be pretty mad if you broke it. Plus, it costs a lot of money. No, I'm joking. <laughs> I can make another one. I don't get mad when pieces get broken, because why would you? And you can always make another one. That may be different for my, for my colleagues here, <laughs> but I can make another one, and <laughs> mine do not take as much work as theirs do. So I'll just scroll through here a bit. So you can see the the translucent quality of that glaze uh, and some of the bubbles that form in it. Again, another very random uh, aspect to this craft. Oh, geez. Um, sorry, this isn't oriented exactly correctly on my, uh, from my screen to this one. Uh, this is a little covered box that has that rice grain porcelain lid. You can see the um, mandala kind of uh, pattern to the top there. Again, each one of those holes is drilled individually. The foot of one of my pieces, uh, I use a lot of times a, an iron wash that I developed a few years ago. I call it meteoric because it reminds me of what you might see in an uh, in a iron-based meteorite, how it oxidizes and uh, and the kind of texture of it. And my mark at the very top, uh, very middle of the inside of the foot there is a flying fish. It's my stamp. Uh, and it is to evoke an idea of an animal or a person doing something atypical, kind of breaking the rules, like a flying fish. <laughs> 
some other pieces that are, you know, um, floral in nature. I have this piece. This is at the uh, State Fair Fine Arts Exhibition right now. Kind of hard to see the uh, pattern shine through, but this is a, it's a lo there's a lotus um, bud in the center. Uh, this is done with a technique called shellac resist, where I paint on a thin layer of an amber shellac. And once the shellac is dried, take a wet sponge to the piece to erode away any pieces that haven't been covered by that shellac. Um, you end up with this kind of relief texture. It is, uh, again, very tricky to do because you're working with porcelain, which wants to fall apart, even on a good day. Uh, and you're asking it to be dried, wetted again, dried and wetted again, and finally fired, and somehow survived through all of this. And when we talk about high fire, we're talking about 2,372 degrees in that kiln. <laughs> uh, things warp, things crack, things break, <laughs> and it's all part of the, the fun of it. Okay, that one we'll skip over there. It's another little... Um, I call this a little bud chowan. A chowan is a, is a Japanese term for a tea bowl. Again, lifting a piece like this up to your lips um, on a sunny day outside and getting to see that light come through. I don't know. I never tire of it. <laughs> and there's the bottom of that piece. And that's what it looks like when there's light not coming through. You can still somewhat see that pattern. This is another one of those shellac resist pieces. Uh, this one is depicting a bamboo forest uh, and fireflies. Uh, this is done in two different layers of that shellac resist. So paint it on, wiped away, let dry again, paint another layer on, wipe that away, and then let it dry finally. Um, I absolutely love doing these shellac resists. I'm not a, I, I'm not a painter either. As I'm not a sculptor, I'm not a painter, but I had to exercise some two-dimensional um, um, painterly aspects. So it's pushing my, my skill set a little bit, which I enjoy. Um, this is the outside of another one of those. This is uh, over on the table as well. Actually, most of these are actually over on the table. Um, these bamboo with grass pieces, uh, this uh, branching with buds on it, uh, evoking springtime. Uh, that's what it looks like without light coming through. And you can see the shell shellac resist and the, the, the relief therein. Another bud. Uh, an older piece here that um, was traded over for a uh, Kevin Russell piece. If you know who he is, he makes very large pieces. So in a, uh, in, an ex in a ceramics exchange, someone ended up with that. I ended up with a piece that I had to literally strap into the front seat of the car because it was so big. <laughs> um, all right, I think that is the end of that. If I might have the Raku folder, that'd be great. Thank you. So when you have these on, um, the holes that you put into it, yes. does that cause it to be more fragile? Yes, and yeah, and they can uh, have a tendency during the drilling and cutting process to crack. It's not, <laughs> yeah, it is not uh, as strong as a lot of other clays out there, especially in that step where it hasn't been fired yet. It is very, very fragile. Um, and so they sometimes break. That's you just have to roll with the punches. <laughs> They're really beautiful. Oh, thank you so much. All right, so this next segment, segment is my um, more sculptural, what's called raku fired pieces. So raku is when you take the piece out of the kiln um, when it's about, I, this, uh, I pull my pieces about 1,800 degrees Fahrenheit and then place them into barrels of combustible material that cause it to flare up. You then cover those barrels causing what's called a reduction atmosphere, turning any clay that's not covered in a glaze or a slip or something like that black. I do a process called naked raku, where I pour on a liquid clay slip, um, which cracks like the mud in a, on, a, on a dry riverbed, so that when I do take it out of the kiln and put it into the combustibles, smoke inundates through the cracks, forms this very unpredictable pattern, and uh, sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. I've fired the same piece four times before I was happy with it. So it's just a little process uh, picture uh, segment here. So pouring that slip on, putting it in the kiln, you can kind of see down at the very bottom where it's cracking and 
par portions of it are falling apart and falling off and then placing it in the combustion chamber and then that's before the lid goes back on but literally just putting this piece that's 1800 degrees into a, a barrel of combustibles be it paper wood shavings just causes it to a light up like a like a bonfire there's another pouring method here and that's what it looks like directly out of that combustion chamber before uh, cracking the uh, slip that I poured on back off and get that lovely pattern starting to get revealed yeah, another piece in the in the fiery inferno. Oh, uh, so that's just the top of a one of the pieces. Sorry that this isn't uh, aligned as much as I tried to uh, at home. And that that is yeah, the top of that 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 first first picture is the copper uh, oxidized copper top that I made to accent the top of this bottle. And this is wheel thrown. It's about. Um, about 16 inches tall to the top of that finial. And again, you're seeing it's all clay except for that top. Um, a lot of folks think that I make like the neck of the bottles out of metal and I have to say, no, actually it's all clay. And uh, uh, where in the bottom half there where you see that crackle design, that's where I would have poured that slip and it would have dried. And then we did that raku firing, which is pulling it out and putting it in combustibles. Um, Again, totally random, and wherever you don't cover the clay, it turns black. So it's a pretty speedy process where normally you have to wait a few days for a piece to get out of the kiln. This takes about mm, 10 minutes. <laughs> Another top to a, a piece, a naked raku. I, I build all my pieces out of copper, bronze, and brass, and then I force patinas on them, uh, either a hot patina, which means torching it and spraying it with cupric nitrate, which is Nothing to be messed with. It's <laughs> for any people who do bronze work, they know how caustic that is. So, mask, shield, gloves, glasses, everything. Well, well ventilated area. Uh, another top for a for a piece that was in a show here, actually. But my background being in in metalworking, I love to incorporate metal into my into my pieces. Yeah, sorry that this isn't aligned Mother either. Amy, what comment might you have? Don, Dad, what do you think? <laughs> I think it's very tight. <laughs> 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 oh. Yeah, he started out young as a knife maker. What was that? Yeah. He started out as a knife maker. Yeah. A knife maker. Don here uh, was so kind in my mid-teenage years to take me to knife making camp <laughs> uh, and blacksmithing camp when I started when I was 15. And he, we would go to this place called Touchstone Center for Crafts. It's, um, it's about an hour south of Pittsburgh. Uh, it has one of the best blacksmithing and bladesmithing facilities in this region, if not the whole US. He would find a, a class, be it glass blowing or nature printing That's or right. metalworking um, to fill his week um, and learn. But he was, he would, we would go for a week at a time and I would get heat stroke and he would make really cool stuff. <laughs> And uh, that's, where, that's where the whole thing began. It took off in, in metalworking, and then that became jewelry. And at that time, I started taking classes here Why with Amy. Why don't you come up and <laughs> join us here to say thank you? Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> and uh, so that's where that started. And then it's just progressed from here, having great teachers like Sarah. Um, in our past, we've had Kathy Grace, Denise Romecki. Um, Sandy Lang, uh, just wonderful, wonderful teachers here. Um, so I'll just skip through. There's, uh, I love adding metal, you know, accents to my work. Uh, the chain is also copper. I made the chain for that. It loops up and through the top of the piece here. Uh, another taller piece, about seven, 16, 17 inches there. Um, this one is a broken chain. It's called Severed Link. Um, that, and at the top is a marble, um, which I made after taking class. Again, at Touchstone, I got the glass working bug and uh, made a glass marble and then tumbled it so it looks uh, frosted, essentially. Sorry, again, this is misaligned, but um, held into with claws there and then the top of that taller piece with the chain. Uh, older Raku pieces, I'll just skim through these ones, but these are Raku pieces, again, with copper ornamentation. Uh, 
And that is that. Uh, and I've just got one little last folder here, and I just wanted to show a couple pieces from that. Sorry if I'm taking too long. <laughs> uh, I think it says local clay slash collaboration. Thank you. All right. Thank you. OK, uh, so this I just wanted to show is an example of local clay that I dug up and processed um, from the area down in Clintonville. I wanted just to experiment with to see how uh, the local clay around here throws and works. So it took a few months to actually process clay that was full of twigs and dirt and sand down to a, uh, a throwable and fireable um, texture. and. Uh, this is what we got out of it. And there's a piece of that over on the table there. It just fired this really lovely dark, dark orange red and uh, made, oh darn, that one's not aligned either. Um, but you get this lovely um, contrast with a nice turquoise glaze. I also wanted to show this piece off, but they are kind of aligned poorly again. This is a collaborative piece that, um, my mom and I did, so it's a bowl that I made with a dark temuku glaze. She made very, uh, she made black clay. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, she made black rocks out of black clay and then added one, um, one lone um, goldfish to it. Thank you so much. And I think that contrast is very striking. And she poured resin, of, of course. And uh, it's hard to even see that there are black rocks kind of blending into the black glaze. But that one goldfish just sets it off so well. Um, that lives currently with my great aunt and uncle, uh, Don's uh, aunt and uncle, uh, in New Jersey. They loved it so much and sent me a message and shipped right on out a couple weeks later. Anyways, thank you so much no, for coming. Right. Appreciate it. <laughs> thank you. And Sophie, and Sarah, and Amy. Wasn't that amazing? Amazing. amazing.